I love being a deacon and I love the call to be a bridge between the church and the world. I think we all understand that a bridge is only effective if it's strong on both sides and on both ends and in the middle. And I am blessed to be a deacon appointed to a local church. And I believe that my, my bridging begins in the local church, connecting the, the congregation with, with the world and uh, doing that primarily through worship and music. My, my calling is to worship in music. And I, I think worship at its best is always a bridge, is always something that connects us not only to God, but to God's world and God's creation. I also, during the pandemic, have, have worked hard to, to connect with people through, through online services. I've, I've uh, created a music opportunity three times a week where I can connect with people. And I think those are bridges as well. When it's not pandemic time, I, I serve over at Elmwood Prison where I, uh, where I have led monthly worship services and done visitation, which of course is a way of bridging and connecting to the world. I've brought people from our church over there to help lead worship and it's, that's a real blessing as well. I'm a, I'm a minister of, of worship and music and my deepest joy is music, has been for a long, long time. And my deepest, deepest joy is, is music in worship and music as worship. I believe music does something that we can't do only through the spoken world. And it connects us in deeper and more profound ways with God and with God's people. And so my deepest joy is music and, and it meets the world's needs as, as, a, as a means of connecting, as a means of being with people. I think of, of specifically the men over at Elmwood and I've never heard a congregation sing the way these 60 or 70 men sing when they're singing, open the eyes of my heart. And there's something about that that feels like an expression of deepest need. But it happens every Sunday. I see people singing. I often see people crying through the music and I often see people raising their hands in joy. And obviously there's something being met there through music. So I feel it's such a blessing to be to be called to this ministry and to be able to, to express my joy and my love for God and for people through music. I feel that I've been a bridge as a hospital chaplain um, all along when I'm connecting with patients in the hospital, um, helping them feel spiritually supported during a very critical time in their lives and often helping the families try to understand this new reality of their loved one's illness. I reach out to community faith leaders all the time um, as a bridge. Um, Oftentimes, if they're Roman Catholic, they're they're wanting special sacraments at, at a end of life time, um, and so I, I call on the priest in the area, and so forth, um, reaching out to interfaith um, leaders all over, um, imams, rabbis, um, wherever they glean um, spiritual support. I, I I do that as a bridge. I also. Um, you know, love to to in, inform my church about what I do, and I I come back to my church and share how I've been a bridge, and that that's another bridge. <laughs> so we build bridges as deacons; it's just natural. I am a singing chaplain. Um, you do not have to be a singing chaplain to do what I do. This is just a little extra <laughs> that I love about my work. Um, so I I just love music i love singing i love playing my guitar when when i can too um but usually it's just me um acapella at a patient's bedside singing their favorite sacred songs or secular songs whatever would give them a boost of peace or joy or um catharsis whatever they are in need of um a song can meet that need i find and it's intertwined with prayer. It is prayer, but very often I'll end a time with a patient um, with a song that will lead into prayer if that's something they, they're open to and, and desire. Um, I also teach a line dancing class for employee wellness at Kaiser Permanente where I serve as a chaplain. And this is so much fun for me. Even during the pandemic, I became a Zumba instructor. <laughs> so I, I use Zumba as well as line dance in the class now. 
and I just I'm I just love what I do like it's it's a joy to be able to come to work and bring your whole self and I don't have to hide away any of my gifts I I share them and I I use them all and that's that's really special as a provisional deacon I bridge the church and the world by serving as a hospital chaplain at Mercy San Juan Medical Center in Carmichael. We are a busy trauma and neuro center with diverse patient population. And in my role as a chaplain, I partner with patients, families, and our medical staff as they experience health crises and loss, often traumatic and unexpected. I find value and joy in supporting others and I believe I meet the world's deepest needs when I meet people where they are on their journey. They grapple with the why questions and searching for God's presence. I reflect and support the role of God's grace in experiences of suffering, mystery, and meaning making. I am a bridge in my support of both individual and communal expressions of faith and where appropriate, encourage connection or recorrect connection to a patient's faith community. I also provide support in advanced care planning, leading difficult conversations with patients and families around goals of care, and bridging the cultural gap between a patient's values and medical practice values. In the hospital, I primarily serve in the emergency department, trauma and surgical ICUs, and the birth center and NICU. And as you can imagine, the last year and a half has been overwhelming in the hospital. I've been one of our primary chaplains to serve the COVID units. I'm a bridge when I sit and process with COVID patients when their loved ones cannot be physically present. Mm -hmm. I facilitate goodbyes and end of life prayers over phone and video. And I support staff in the midst of their compounded grief, overwhelm and moral distress. And as I partner with folks in the hospital, I'm also still in the process of my own faith journey and call I look forward to how God continues to work in my life. While I move towards ordination and full connection with UMC, I'm also in the process of obtaining national board certification for chaplains. As a provisional deacon appointed to the local church, I feel like um, I'm constantly in motion between the church and the world. I'm constantly traversing that bridge. Um, so the church is, is like home base and headquarters. Um, and I work mostly with children and youth. And so part of that work involves um, training and educating our youth and children um, about our faith, about our church, and then taking them with me across that bridge to whatever it is that the world needs. Uh, and there is no greater joy than seeing a young person discover the power of their God-given gifts and to have that training and realize that it can be put into action uh, to meet the world's greatest needs. Um, so for me, I see part of my role as, um, as nurturing and um, forming young disciples who then I, I take with me across the bridge and they create disciples and transform the world outside of the church. And there's nothing like that feeling of seeing them come into their own spiritually. And I am humbled and honored to be a part of their journey. I have served at the Truckee United Methodist Church as a pastor for four years, but my recent move to Reno, albeit very different, uh, actually puts me quite close to my two appointments. My primary appointment is at the Northern Nevada Correctional Center in Carson City, and my secondary appointment is with Pastor Chris Gallagher, Gallagher at the Reno First United Methodist Church. And I continue to work as a clinical pharmacist in order to support my family, as well as my volunteer and travel habits. My work in the prison stopped very abruptly with the start of the pandemic as I worked in there as a volunteer. So during my 17 volunteer hours per week, I facilitated an amazing restorative justice program called Houses of Healing for 48 male medium security inmates. I also served as a chaplain in their hospice unit, and part of that service was to meet weekly for a grief and sharing group with the inmate volunteers who tended to the hospice patients. And on Sundays, I went in there as a sponsor so that the inmates could gather to worship. My call to this deacon work happened in 2012 when I felt very compelled to become a chaplain to those who were living in a state of poverty, 
uh, whether it be physical or emotional, financial, or, you know, all the other ways people feel less than and cast away. Since then, I realized that my gift and my deepest joy really is to journey with another in their difficult times, offering a safe space for their souls to feel and to heal. My deacon vows of word and service, justice and compassion call me into a broken world full of souls needing tended to. I was board certified as a clinical chaplain and pastoral counselor through the Center for Spiritual Care and Pastoral Formation. And I went to uh, Claremont School of Theology. Now, I was trained as an interfaith chaplain. Um, I did my four units of CCE, heavily soaked in justice and compassion. I worked as the San Francisco night minister, and I did restorative justice facilitation at the California State Prison in Sacramento. And these two units, they bookended um, more compassionate work on the oncology unit in Sutter Roseville. And now I'm currently enrolled in a two-year certificate course for spiritual direction through the Christian Formation and Direction Ministry of Nevada. I'm anxious to get back to the prison as soon as they let me in. I know the guys are really aching for this bridge, you know. In the meantime, I attempt to live and love and as a, as a compassionate and just manner as possible. And I just say, may God bless you and may it be well with your souls. I was ordained two years ago during the onset of the pandemic. And while my journey to this moment has been lifelong, it continues to unfold, revealing so many unimaginable things. I have been appointed by the Bishop to serve our community as a pastoral psychotherapist. I do that in both a very traditional office setting, as well as on a horse ranch where I work mostly with youth and military veterans like myself. I have been endorsed as a pastoral counselor by the United Methodist Church and provide voluntary chaplaincy services to a few local hospitals. Finally, as a deacon, my secondary appointment is with Campbell United Methodist Church, where I serve as a deacon of Reconciling Ministries. On my journey towards ordination, I was asked to participate in a mission and immersion experience. And while I initially approached that as yet another thing to check off a list, it turned out to be one of the most surprisingly profound experiences of my process. I went to Puerto Rico with a team of 11 others to help in the recovery efforts of Hurricane Maria. During that time, we worked on two homes that had been severely damaged. I not only worked alongside those from our team, but also local contractors, sharing stories and experiences as we laid a new roof. Perhaps even more amazing was the deep connection that I made uh, with others, including the homeowners, Nadia and Hector as we sat and talked over meals that she had prepared for us. Two years later, and I continue to talk with Nadia and look forward to returning to Puerto Rico. Inspired by that experience, I had begun working with a Reconciling United Methodist Church in Kenya, initially by providing individual and couples counseling services across the church community. As that bridge was taking shape, another need began to emerge. And I now find myself working with the local pastor to build a clean water collection system for its community. Finally, for the last eight years, I have also organized a coalition of 12 Reconciling United Methodist Churches around the Silicon Valley Pride event building bridges between those churches and the LGBTQ plus community has been an amazing experience. And this year, we took it one step further, reimagining what greater inclusion might look like as we held our first interfaith worship service as part of that event. All of this punctuates the source of my greatest joy as I serve to break down barriers 
while bringing people together in community, celebrating their wholeness and gifts. Uh, as a deacon serving uh, as the director of international student engagement at Amherst College in Massachusetts, you know, I'm grateful to being a bridge for young, young students, young college students here at Amherst College. You know, my ministry is mainly to support students of international experience through advocacy and pastoral care and centralized resources and co-curricular education programs for community building and critical reflection. So I really try to build a vibrant community here where young students feel empowered and connected with a sense of belonging. And I regularly meet with international students who are going through challenges and crises, you know, especially mental health issues. You know, I help them to adjust to the new culture from the most basic living conditions to the complex social context in the United States. And recognizing that students have multifaceted identities, I have aimed to create spaces and opportunities for students to express and learn from and value individual and intersecting identities, including religious identity that they hold. You know, international students come to the U.S. with very rich religious and spiritual backgrounds. So in collaboration with Spiritual Life Office at Amherst College, I help students to engage critically and creatively uh, with multiple religious and spiritual traditions. And we offer programs to talk about what revolutionary love and radical hope would look like during the COVID pandemic. And we offer programs like Soul Food Sunday and multi-faith Thanksgiving dinner where students can meet and deepen their relationships among religious and spiritual and secular students and also foster you know, uh, dialogues across differences. And I continue to build bridges between the church and the world and help students understand the complexity of reality and they can practice compassion and embrace others without judgment and experience God's love and grace on their journey here at Amherst College. Every year, my office, uh, International Student Engagement Office, offers a week-long pre-orientation for first-year international students. And we bring students from every corner of the world, but under the COVID pandemic, it was not an easy job to do. And there were travel restrictions and U.S. embassies were temporarily closed and students couldn't get vaccines. And even though they got vaccines and couldn't find affordable and available flights to the United States. And we had a one student who planned to come to Amherst from Afghanistan. But a week, uh, a few weeks before his departure and Taliban took over the government and his flight got canceled. In fact, all flights out of Kabul were on pause as the airport shuts down to all commercial airplanes. So we were on a mission to bring him to campus safely. So as soon as the airport began processing flights, we coordinated him to get on one of the US evacuation flights. And his evacuation flights was first landed in Germany at a US base and then a flight to Dallas and Dallas to Connecticut. And then we drove him from Connecticut to Massachusetts Amherst. And he finally arrived uh, to campus on the night of September 8th. I still remember that night. After two weeks, he had departed from Kabul. So when I met him, and he, he looked tired, of course, and but his eyes were full of joy. And I greeted him with a big hug and told, me, told him that you made it. You made it and you are safe here. And he smiled back at me and said, yes, I'm here. This is a beautiful place and thank you so much for everything. And I would say that night was one of those moments when the shepherd finally found his lost sheep and when my deepest joy met the world's deepest needs. I have two ministry settings. First, I work for a small nonprofit, the Child Health and Development Studies. I help epidemiologists that are committed to investigating how health and disease are passed on between generations, not just by genes, but also through the environment and social surroundings. And these scientists and I both share a passion to make the world a better place. Before COVID, I also had a ministry of presence to my coworkers, two of whom are Jewish, as well as to the people in the neighborhood where our office is located, the Gourmet Ghetto in Berkeley. 
My second ministry setting is Elsa Brandy UMC. In the past year, I've become part of the leadership team of a group of concerned citizens interested in creating a safe space to discuss community issues. So far, we've held an all-day workshop and a town hall, which was held at the church, to brainstorm ways to address homelessness in El Sobrani. We structure our meetings on models created by Braver Angels, a national citizens group working to bring Americans together by bridging the partisan divide. One of my deepest joys is helping to create a sacred space where people can experience a transformative encounter with the divine, an encounter which will draw them deeply into God and will move them to help heal the hurts of the world. And I often do this through music, particularly with songs of social justice or songs from the global church. When I lead the congregation in singing the Brazilian song, for the troubles and the sufferings of the world, God, we call upon your mercy, the whole creation's laboring in pain. My prayer is that the people will find a connection with those that are suffering and then feel called to action. I'm currently appointed to the Hospice of Santa Cruz County as a chaplain providing spiritual and emotional support for patients and their loved ones. And I'm a bridge for God's love into the world for those who are, are nearing death and experiencing those moments of, of life transitions of dealing with death and beyond. In a given day, I address the world's deepest needs in ways I don't know what will bring God's love to fruition. I could be cheering up a patient who might be lost in, in their care facility and cannot find their way back to the room, while also supporting one of my own um, team nurses who had just lost their dog, while also sitting in silence with family members as they say their final goodbyes and also um, being with uh, patients who have no family, who are, are fearing death with, um, filled with regrets. Um, and I could be ending my day talking to someone what the afterlife, what heaven, what God means for me. It's filled with twists, turns, ske set schedules and emergency visits, uh, meetings with patients and loved ones and staff members. It, the days could be filled with joy and filled with heartbreaking moments that could bring you to your knees. And yet every day is a true blessing to be present with others and to recognize God's love here in this space. In my, my position um, here in Willow Glen, I serve half time as the children's pastor and I serve half time as the um, preschool director here for our church um, preschool. And in that job, um, I'm a bridge to families every day, um, connecting them to the the idea that church is is a support for them as they raise their families, whether or not we are there, their family church, um, we are a place to to partner with them as they raise their children, um, and that's been that's been a really real big blessing for me, um, not only to have those students in my life every day, but to be to be connected to their families and supportive of their families. Um, and I think the last thing I would say is that since COVID, um, the the children's ministry part of my job has, has been, has felt even more like bridge building, even within the local congregation, um, because families weren't able to come to church and some still aren't comfortable with that. Um, I've done a lot more outreach and visiting on people's porches and delivering supplies and finding ways for our children, especially to be active together, but also be safe and to also practice their faith in the community. So when um, last spring they were interested in um, caring for the earth and nature, we found a way that we could do a park cleanup day um, and a gardening day where they could safely be outside and and still, even in the midst of COVID, be active in their community. And so finding those bridge opportunities um, has been has been a little more difficult during COVID, I will say, but but has also opened up a lot of doors for for ways that we can 
we can practice our faith together and really be intentional about it. Whereas before I waited for, for families to come to me and now I'm, I'm often finding myself going to them and, and asking a little more intentionally, what, what do you need from your church right now? And asking children that specifically as well. My deepest joy has always been working with children. From the time I was in elementary school, that was that was my call. And um, when I when I heard that as a call into ministry to work in the church and in the community, um, and really solidified that, it has it has been a joy for me ever since. Um, I think where that meets our deepest need now is in um, is in helping our children identify themselves as people of faith. And we are, we are even as adults afraid to name ourselves as Christian or as people of faith in certain settings. And, um, and that's okay, I get that. We don't need to wear it on our chests all the time, but um, for our children to, to claim that identity and to wrestle with it um, is, is I feel a great need in our in our greater community for us to know who we are as individuals and to be able to engage with the world um, with our values and and our beliefs and our understanding of of the world and ourselves and who God is and how we all relate to one another. Um, so so my work with children is is my greatest joy. I love to to just listen to their questions and hear their answers and kind of talk through it with them but to also know that they're um they're they're cementing that into themselves they're they're claiming it as their own it's not the faith that that just their parents have told them about it's the faith that they are growing in themselves and that hopefully um because i believe the world needs that um, hopefully when they are young young teenagers and young adults, um, they will take that into the world with them and the world will be a better place because they know who they are as children of God. I have been a bridge in my ministry when I take the church through the homeless encampment in San Jose. Taking the church to meet people where they are has been the joy of my life in the ministry that I do to the homeless. I'm really enjoying seeing people happy when I come to visit them and see them where they are. I believe that my deepest joy also lies in the fact that I can meet people where they are and I can offer bread of the body, the physical need, and also for their soul. Being able to pray with these homeless people in their own little tent and visiting with them and Spending time with them has been the joy of my life. And I see that there's need for it. They are really enjoying the visit that I do to the homeless in their little tent. And I am so happy that their need is met by the small visits that I do make to these uh, homeless encampments. I'm currently appointed to pursue doctoral studies at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. Uh, and my research there is focused on liturgical practice in Christian Holy Land pilgrimage. Uh, throughout my studies, I've been a bridge to the other constituencies of the GTU, including students, faculty, staff, and administration. And uh, through my roles as a student and a teaching assistant, uh, I have uh, been a bridge uh, to those constituencies and uh, I'm also currently a bridge with an emerging interreligious group of scholars uh, at the GTU who study pilgrimage. Uh, my own academic work is enriched through this interfaith collaboration and I'm able to represent a justice-oriented Christian perspective among other scholars studying pilgrimage. One of my deepest joys is music making. Uh, and I believe that the world needs music. Uh, music is integral to our well being. Uh, so, in addition to being a doctoral student, I am also a cellist and uh, a choral singer. Uh, in fact, I first began serving the church through music ministry, uh, playing the cello in worship and uh, singing in uh, church youth choirs. 
Uh, I also play music out in the world as a member of the cello section of the Bay Area Rainbow Symphony. Uh, although live music has been curtailed through the pandemic, uh, I have been able to share my joy of music making in online worship uh, by making music videos for my home. As the Minister of Community Engagement, Advocacy and Justice assigned to San Francisco, I feel it is my ministry to be the bridge between the United Methodist Churches in San Francisco and the city of St. Francis. Uh, as part of my ministry, I became a community chaplain. Uh, the police department of San Francisco felt that the community needed its own chaplains during community and personal crisis and community unrest. So we respond to situations that the police department alerts us to, for instance, earthquake, families having to identify a body at the morgue or a family being given notification of a family member's death. I've sat in the city emergency dispatchers during their shifts because in San Francisco, the dispatchers take calls from the police department. They take medical emergency calls and also calls uh, for the fire department. And some of the calls, as you can imagine, can be emotionally overwhelming. And so the police department felt that their dispatchers just needed uh, someone to be there. So I'm there to be a presence if they want to talk and just kind of process the calls that they had on that particular shift or something that's held over from another shift, uh, just, to, just to be there and talk to them. I've also participated in an annual vigil that a mother holds every year for her son at the intersection where he was killed. But unfortunately, his murderer has not been arrested. So that's why she holds this vigil every year. So every year we as a community and the community chaplains hold that space for his memory and the memory of other young black men whose murderers have not been arrested. So, like I said, we just stand there and hold the space with her and comfort the other mothers that also come and bring support to her. Also, at the beginning of the pandemic, I served as kind of a conduit between the city and United Methodist Churches because the protocols and guidelines were constantly changing, as you know. So, um, and I was able to also obtain PPE for the churches at, from the city at no charge, which was also an added bonus. My deepest joy comes when people find their own strength in their voice. Uh, I love the quote from uh, Dr. Howard Thurman, who says, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. And I think that just wraps up for me what I feel my deepest joy in when people, you know, come to the point of knowing their own voice and their own strength because so many of us feel that you know the government or other people are better qualified to solve you know our problems or the problems of the world but what the world needs is uh people who have found their voice for justice and equity and aren't afraid to use that voice and I think, you know, we as Christians are in a unique position to know the value and inspiration and strength of what one solitary life can do. And that life being Jesus and what he was able to do, a life that inspired and encouraged all of us to be our best selves. So a life that cares for others, that has empathy, 
That is the type of life that can change the direction of the world and be the change that we all want to see in the world.